Good morning. There is only one demonstration that we need ever make. If we succeed in making this one demonstration, everything else will be found included in our experience. Whether it is health, whether it is wisdom, supply, peace. There is nothing that will not be added unto us or found included in us if we succeed in the one and only demonstration that ever must be made. This does not mean that throughout the length of our human span there will not be occasional problems to be met but it means that they are of no importance because they are merely a part of our experience of living life. Let's come back to that later. <clears throat> the demonstration that we have to make is the demonstration of truth. No other demonstration. Let us illustrate that in this way. There is a scriptural truth Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Uh, that is a truth. As a matter of fact, that is the truth. It is the only truth there is. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, where the consciousness of the presence of God is, there is liberty. Now, if we can demonstrate that one truth, we will have demonstrated all there is to harmonious existence. If we can demonstrate, first of all, the Spirit of the Lord, we will then uh, have demonstrated liberty. Not merely political liberty or economic liberty, but liberty from the world, freedom from the world. The only liberty there really is, uh, is a liberty from the things of the world, a freedom from the thoughts and things of the world. As we have had here in prayer, it's all right to pray for anything you want as long as you're not praying for anything of this world. Well, it is the same thing in this that when you secure your liberty, you secure it from the thoughts and things of this world, the fears, the doubts, the concerns, the problems of this world. So that, <clears throat> if we were faced with a problem of health or of supply or of happiness, there would be no use in trying to demonstrate health or supply or happiness because they are not to be achieved separate and apart from the demonstration of the Spirit of the Lord. The thing to demonstrate would be the Spirit of the Lord because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty from these things of the world. So that... As we sit here in meditation and communion, we have but one desire, and that is for the realization of the Spirit of the Lord, to feel this presence of God, to become aware in one way or another of an actual transcendental spiritual presence and power. We do not know in what form that experience would come to us. It might come to each one in a different way. And uh, there's no use speculating about it. We have a major theme 
where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And so our concern must be to achieve uh, the realization of the Spirit of the Lord and let it appear in whatever form it will and uh, dispense with our problems as it will. The Spirit of the Lord is as tangible as anything that you see here on that table or this. It is just as concrete, just as evident to spiritual sense as these are to material sense. And so in the life of every seeker after God, there must come a time for that experience, a time when they say, I've certainly read about it long enough, and I've heard about it long enough, but actually I don't know even if it's true, because I've never experienced it. I've heard people speak of it, I've read of it in books, and I've even sometimes seen the fa look on their faces when they experienced it, but still I haven't felt myself the Spirit of the Lord. You remember the Master? saying, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. And with that Spirit of God, I am enabled to heal the sick, comfort the mourner. Well, so it is. The very moment that the Spirit of the Lord touches an individual, they are transformed. The degree of the transformation may not be great in the visible realm. It is great on the within. Oh, no, sometimes, sometimes it uh, comes as such a startling thing that even the within doesn't quite grasp the full significance of it. But it is only a very short period of adjustment after the Spirit of the Lord has touched one when inwardly they understand the meaning of rebirth, of being born again, of not being the same person they were yesterday or last week. And then sometimes, bit by bit, it becomes evident in the outer world. Sometimes it becomes evident uh, in negative appearances. Sometimes we first have to lose before we gain. That is, it would seem so in the outer realm. Only those who lose their lives can gain it. That is, they have to lose their present sense of life in order to gain it. Some people, in leaving their nets, have found themselves, as I did, going through uh, economic problems, financial problems, experiencing lack. And that was as the old uh, source of supply, the material sense, disappeared, and with it the sources, and uh, the full and complete realization of the new had not taken place. And so there was an interval when uh, observers looking at my demonstration might have said, and some did say, uh, you have given up the reality for a dream. And like all dreamers, you're starving in an attic and it serves you right. That was the outer picture. To their sense, there was just an individual who had always enjoyed the best and most and now experiencing a sense of lack and limitation. But they couldn't see that that was the breaking up of the old forms and then the new appearing. And so it is 
<clears throat> that uh, at a later period I went through the same experience with physical health. I've only had one illness in 25 years since I'm in this work. Well, that one made up for the whole 25 years. But, evidently, it was a necessary thing at that time to save me from the mistake of boasting of health. Because it is as foolish to boast of my health as it is to boast of my supply when the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Do you see that? Sooner or later, we all have to realize that health is not of me or of my body. Health is of God. We all have to learn <coughs> that supply is not of me, nor does it belong to me. <coughs> it is of God. And so, sometimes, the breaking up of our material reliances takes the form in the outer picture uh, or takes a negative appearance in the outer picture as if we were losing something, giving up something, sacrificing something. It isn't true and inwardly we know it. Once the Spirit of the Lord has touched you, you know, well, of course, you're not touched by outer appearances anymore and uh, they don't concern you even while you are going through the discords, because you recognize them to be a part of the transitional experience. I could, if you can see this vision with me, I could use the example of the Christian martyrs going to their death in, uh, out in the arena thrown to the lions or burned at the stake. And uh, probably, if you were to think right now, you'd say, well, that's more than I would do for a Christian religion or an infinite way religion or any other. Don't ask me to go to prison for you or to get burnt up at the stake for you or get thrown to the lions. And you can't be blamed because you're thinking in terms of your physical bodies and their discomforts and of a human sense of life. But the very minute that the Spirit of the Lord touches you, all of this outer world fits into its place and uh, only one thing is important and that is the fulfillment of one's spiritual mission. And who's concerned then with whether they get an overdose of heat or cold or whatever else the picture may present. But that, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to look at those martyrs being thrown to the lions or being burned at the stake or Peter standing there being stoned. It doesn't make sense. And it never will to the human. It is only when the Spirit of the Lord has touched one and you have seen that nothing is being lost, sacrificed, or given up, that there is no martyrdom actually. It's only martyrdom to those who are looking on and don't understand it is actually fulfillment of one's spiritual destiny and experience. And that which is gained is more than compensation for that which the world says is lost. It is very much like uh, the world's attitude about our probably not spending time at cards or dancing or too much at... Uh, theater and so forth, and uh, wondering what we ever gain to make up for such terrific losses, such sacrifices of human pleasures. And if you were to say there is no pleasure in uh, a card game or roulette or dice or uh, drinking, uh, they'd say, oh, now you must be crazy. And uh, to their sense you would be, because the God of this world is pleasure. The God of this world is escapism. 
And so, to say that that God is nothingness, no, you must be a martyr if you're giving up that God. And of course you know you're not because what you have gained more than compensates for the illusory nature of what has been lost. But none of this, none of this is real. None of this is real to any individual unless or until they have attained that spirit of the Lord and found their liberty, their complete freedom from all concern for the things and thoughts of this world in the compensation which has come with the understanding and attainment of the realities. And so it is that we, in this work, are at the place which is on uh, reel number 12. Well, the other side, the first side of this one that will carry today's message, experience of the Christ. We are at that stage in our unfoldment when uh, for eight years, in the infinite way, and as many years before as you may have been in some other metaphysical work, we have heard of the beauties of the Christ, of the power of the Christ. We have heard of the healing influence of the Christ. We have known experiences of it. And we have experienced ourselves many of the benefits of uh, someone else's attainment of this Spirit of the Lord. But now it becomes necessary, first, for those in this room, and those who are listening to these tapes, to actually take it upon themselves to determine that now is the time for them to attain this Spirit of the Lord. If it's to be done at any time in history, it can be done now. Because those who have been led to this point, whether in this room or hearing these tapes, are at the point of readiness, if they haven't already experienced it, to experience the presence of the Lord. Those who have experienced it must come to that place where they can experience it at will, move in and out, be in this world but not of it, walk up and down this world but not partake of it, and uh, walk in and out of the past, the present, the future. Walk in and out of the discords, inharmonies, as well as the pleasures and harmonies of this world, and yet maintain their own spiritual identity in uh, the kingdom of heaven. Those who attain the kingdom of heaven can also walk on earth. They can walk in and out, up and down. I can lay down my life and I can pick it up, says the Master. And it is true. You can partake of the things of this world, but you can lay them down. And uh, you can uh, walk in and around uh, the heavenly scenes even while walking the streets of this universe. And... Uh, it is destined that every individual on the face of the globe know the experience of God. In the end, every knee shall bend. Now, as the world witnesses the benefit of this spiritual experience, it opens itself in a measure to the same experience. First, because it wants the loaves and fishes that come from uh, the experience, and then secondly, interest in the experience itself is aroused. All over, we are having the experience of individuals who discover one or another of the books or recordings, and then write that another couple is with them uh, 
uh, listening to the tapes or hearing the books, reading the books, or a small group has gathered, and so it is that wherever one is touched, others quickly follow in. And it is only because there is a one here and there, only because there was uh, a Jesus Christ, that there could later be disciples and apostles and then a public. Only because there was a Mrs. Eddy that there could have been teachers and practitioners and then finally a whole world membership. Always the presentation of the Christ has to come through an individual. But that individual is you as well as me and as well as every other one who has shown it forth because regardless of who the individual may be Lao Tse, Buddha, Jesus, John, Paul or these modern Mrs. Eddy or Mrs. Fillmore they as individuals can only reach a limited group it has always been so but it is uh, that limited group that goes out and expands itself into uh, more groups and then uh, the circle begins widening and so as the world comes into it it comes into it because of individuals one individual in this city and one in that and a small group in the other and so the circle spreads until it encompasses the universe now there is a Christ there is a spirit of God therefore there is a spirit of God to be realized to be attained the time has passed for one individual to set themselves up to represent or be that spirit of God on earth the time is here when every individual must be the showing forth of that spirit. And if I, in my small way, can bring to a few the experience of the Spirit of the Lord, then in turn each one of those who experience it are enabled to go out and do the same thing. And only in that way, the world will not be saved by a savior. It's had three or four of the greatest saviors that ever can be realized. Uh, and I doubt that the world would accept any more saviors. I doubt that the world is in a frame of mind now to say that there's anyone greater than Buddha or Jesus or John or Paul. I doubt that the world is ready to accept that there are any more spiritual lights even possible on earth. And so the time has come when the world must not look for a savior, which it will never have again as person, but must look for a savior, which is the spirit of the Lord. That must be the savior, not a man, not a woman. The savior must be the spirit of the Lord, and the Spirit of the Lord, if there is such a thing, must be achieved by you and by me individually. Then and then only can our neighbors or friends or relatives say that you do bear witness to something transcendental, that is, something beyond human ken. You do bear witness to something beyond man's understanding. Now, it is possible that you read what I imagine to be the most interesting of the entire series of religious uh, articles in the Saturday Honolulu Star Bulletin. I, to me, that was the outstanding article of the entire series. And uh, this man took all those who read it one half of the way to heaven. He destroyed in his article all of the nonsense 
of churchianity and showed it for what it really isn't. But he hadn't discovered that there is a spirit of the Lord. No, he was only able to point out the errors uh, of uh, superstitious belief. But at no point was he able to show forth that there is a spirit of the Lord. All these other articles merely were in the nature of advertising for their particular denominations, beliefs. But here at least was one that showed up the fallacy of them. Now, the next step, and it's the next step that every individual must take when uh, the temple has been cleansed of its superstitions and of its beliefs, now it must come to the time where it says, all right, I will place no value on any things, any beliefs, any doctrines, any creeds, any teachings, but center my entire consciousness on attaining the spirit of the Lord itself and let it be my creed, my ritual, my guide, my conscience, my cause and all that I am to this world. You see, the most that a teaching can do, a spiritual teaching, is to lead an individual to the realization that there is a kingdom of God within them and give them the inspiration and desire to achieve it. And the most that a spiritual teacher can do is to open the consciousness of those individuals who look to him so that they may attain the realization and demonstration of the Spirit of the Lord. But one teacher, as we have seen in the case of Jesus Christ, cannot do it for the world, not even for his own disciples, except the few who are really and truly receptive and responsive. Judas he couldn't do it for, and half a dozen of the others are nowhere heard of. And so it is that only those deeply, deeply, deeply touched can be given the actual experience by another of this Spirit of the Lord. So it is that in every age there have been mystics and every mystics, some of the men, some of the women, have uh, been enabled to open the consciousness to the actual Spirit of the Lord, the actual experience of the Spirit of the Lord. In many cases, hundreds attained it and realized it from the teacher. But the world went on its merry way to destruction just the same because those who attained it from their teacher did not go and do likewise, but rather stayed back to worship that teacher and build a lot of stone edifices to him or for him. Do you see that? Now, that is a mistake that we are not making and will never make. Everyone here who attains through this work the touch of the Christ will be expected to open the same avenue of consciousness for others as it has been done to them. They can use the same books as uh, textbooks. They can use the same literature as inspiration. But they must go out and by their witnessing to the activity of Christ and in individual consciousness, they must make it first of all clear that it is possible to their friends, neighbors, relatives to attain the same thing. And then, in the case of those who indicate enough interest, actually lead them to the experience. <clears throat> it is a very beautiful thing to watch that some uh, students whom I have never met 
who are merely infinite way students through the writings and recordings are attaining this very spirit of the Lord, realizing it, bringing it through in their experience and uh, setting it forth as an example to others uh, in their immediate vicinity. Now, the day will come when this realization will be so strong in them that they too will be able to open the consciousness of others to the experience. And so we're going to stop now for another period of uh, meditation because you will know this. And I will give you this. And at least for the balance of this month, let it be the song in your heart. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Wherever the realization of this Spirit is, there is a freedom from the thoughts and the things of this world, from the cares and concerns of this world, and there is a, an attainment of divine grace, the things of the spiritual world. It says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. That where a consciousness is available through which God can function, there is an entrance for God, the Christ, into human consciousness. In other words, as, for instance, I sit here in this silence, attuned to this infinite invisible, and uh, the activity of the Christ can function through my consciousness, it can reach and touch yours, and illumine, heal, save, and supply. It would be it, the activity of the Christ, functioning in and through me, reaching, touching, illumining your consciousness. Then again, wherever you are in meditation, remember, remember, that your meditation isn't to get something for yourself for God or for anyone else either. The purpose of the meditation is merely to open yourself to the Spirit of the Lord. Then, as the Spirit of the Lord enters, or perhaps not so much enters as uh, exits, as the Spirit of the Lord finds outlet through your consciousness, it touches the life of another or the lives of others, touches their consciousness to awaken it, touches their bodies to bring what we call healing. Anyhow, in opening your consciousness for the activity of the Christ and uh, by not restricting it or directing it, you permit it to escape into human consciousness and uh, bring with it God's grace wherever an individual is opening themselves to God's grace. Just think, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Wherever you are open to the activity of the Christ, the Spirit of the Lord enters and sets you free from the thoughts and things of this world, but it also touches the consciousness of others in your circle, perhaps. And you thereby become an instrument through which the activity of the Christ can reach others in this world. All right, let us meditate again. 
Now watch the difference in your approach to, let us say, being of help spiritually in your household or in the experience of others who may turn to you for help by remembering instantly that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, you will lose all sense of personal responsibility of having to do something or having to know something or having to understand something and uh, you will immediately sit back in the realization, well, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, so Let me now attain the realization of the Spirit of the Lord. Let me be still at peace. And you will learn to abide in stillness, in peace, in quietness, in confidence until that feeling of the presence touches you. And then you will say, ah, it is done. And then you can truthfully say, God has done it. Without any feeling that, oh yes, but look what I did. Or look what I thought. Or look what my understanding is. Because now you will clearly perceive that your understanding had nothing to do with it and your mental work had nothing to do with it because you didn't do any. But that actually it was a spiritual experience and not a mental hocus pocus or an, an exhibition of personal healing power. You see, there is a Christ. There is a Christ healing influence. There is a spiritual power. There is a spiritual presence. But you don't direct it. You don't possess it. But you can be an instrument through which it is released into the experience of those who touch you on life's highway. Do you see that? And uh, the way you do it, begin with where the Spirit of the Lord is. There is liberty. Thy grace is the sufficiency in every case. And so, attain then this consciousness of the presence of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord, and attain this feeling of thy grace being on the field, and then let it flow out into the world of experience to do its work. You become the instrument. You see, it goes back only to the Master, I can of my own self do nothing. This father within me, he doeth the works. It's his principle. This doctrine isn't mine, it's his. If I were to speak of myself or my own powers, I would speak a lie. The whole thing, the whole secret is that there is a father within me, the Spirit of the Lord, the Christ, divine grace, anything you want to call it. And uh, that through my consciousness, it can operate. Through me as an instrument. Why through me as an instrument? Because I have realized its presence and can thereby make a nothingness of myself sufficient for it to take over. It can't operate through the person saying, I, 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 me, mine. It can't operate through the person still with a belief that their understanding or their power can do anything. And so you will find that this was the vision of uh, the original book, The Infinite Way, when it said, Be a beholder. It doesn't say anything about being a Christ. It doesn't say anything about walking up and down the world with a big understanding, doing something. It says, Be a beholder. Attain that state of consciousness that can sit back and behold God at work in God's universe, can behold nature bringing forth its beauties and its glories without saying, I did it, or I'm needed to help it. Do you see that? If there wasn't an individual on the face of the globe, God's glories would be just as great. The activity of God would be just as great. In some cases it might be better. It has been said there's nothing wrong with the world, there's only something wrong with people. So perhaps without people, God's glory would be made even more evident. 
But in as much as we are people and we're dealing with people, there is a way whereby we can attain liberty, freedom, joy, harmony, peace, dominion, abundance, glory, happiness, unitedness, unity, oneness, contentment. And that way is through the Spirit of the Lord, through the attainment of that mind which was also in Christ Jesus. Now we begin in this work to do it without the benefit of words or thoughts, just by the expectancy within us, the silence, the listening, the inner peace. Oh, it doesn't mean that for a while thoughts may not intrude into our mind, but we can always meet those thoughts with, yes, but the spirit of, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Thy grace is my sufficiency. My peace I give unto you. My peace. I, we can always take things like that into our meditation to quiet whatever human thoughts may be percolating there. And... Uh, this realization that it is the Spirit of the Lord that uh, makes liberty, that it is thy grace that is a sufficiency, that it is my peace that runs the world, that is a setting aside of ourselves and giving a recognition to a transcendental being, presence, power, and uh, letting it perform its work through our consciousness. Let us be silent again. This will not in any way nullify a single unfoldment that is in the infinite way literature, nor will it in any wise act to prevent our gaining consciousness, wisdom, and uh, further measure of the letter of truth from these writings and recordings, but the writings and the recordings become only a basis or foundation on which we can do that which we are doing here today. In other words, we can forget all of the letter of truth today because we already know the letter of truth and have it embodied in our consciousness. Because we already know that I and the Father are one, because we already know the illusory nature of that which appears on earth as discord, because we already know uh, the nature of God, the nature of prayer, the nature of the Christ, the nature of error, because we know the nature of God as individual being, as your being and mine, we can afford to sit here now without thinking of any of these things and merely open ourselves to the experience of the Spirit of the Lord. If we had not taken these steps before this, if we were not thoroughly familiar with the writings, recordings, or whatever constitutes the letter of the Word, then we would be attempting something in the nature of a blind faith, which, uh, even if we accomplished it, wouldn't remain with us as a uh, a permanent dispensation. Many, many, many people in the world have had a God experience, have realized the Spirit of the Lord, and then nothing happened the rest of their life except that they had to live on the memory of it. Because, first of all, they didn't know how they attained it. Secondly, they didn't know how to maintain it. Third, they didn't know what it meant. It was just one of those acts of grace that took place for which they had no explanation. With us it is different. We know that if it takes place, that it takes place for one major reason, and that is whatever time and effort you have put in to uh, the study of spiritual wisdom and the practice of meditation, that will uh, be the main responsibility, what you have put into it. Therefore, you will know that you can always not only relive it, but that you can relive it every day of the week and uh, six times on Sunday, if you so desire, by the same token by which you first experienced it. 
That is, the study, the meditation, abiding in the Word and letting the Word abide in you. So it will be no secret to you or no mystery to you when the actual Spirit of the Lord comes into your experience because you'll say, ah, yes, as consciousness unfolds spiritually, as we lose faith in the things and thoughts and uh, transfer our allegiance to the infinite invisible, in that degree of spiritual unfoldment, am I losing those barriers that separate me from the God experience? And so, of course, you will know that as you continue to abide in spiritual wisdom, whether you read it or whether you hear it or whether you think it, as you continue to abide in meditation and receptivity, this Spirit of the Lord will uh, come as a continued experience, a frequent experience, until that day takes over when it will be one that you attain at will. You can turn within any time you like and come out with the realization that the presence of the Lord has touched me, the Spirit of the Lord has touched me. And that will then continue by your own abiding in faithfulness until the day when the Spirit, well, it may say as it has heretofore, I have walked with you, but now I am beside you. And then at a later time it may say, heretofore I have walked beside you, but now I am within you. And then finally you hear it say, heretofore I have been within you, but now I am you. I speak as you. I think as you. My power appears on earth as your power. My home is your home, and your home now is really my home. Your consciousness and my consciousness are one and the same because it's my consciousness. Do you see? And that is the union. And from then on, Paul has achieved it. And he says, I live, yet not I. It is now Christ that lives as my individual experience, although you still see me on earth as Paul, the old man Saul, the new man Paul. But with all of that, I am neither Saul nor Paul. I'm the Christ, appearing thus to you. And that comes as an experience to everyone who attains complete union with God. And everyone attains complete union with God after they have come into the realization that there is a Spirit of the Lord that makes free and uh, I can experience that very Spirit of the Lord and its freedom. Not my freedom, its freedom. I don't have any more freedom than I have wisdom or supply. It's Christ's freedom that we experience. It's Christ's life that we live. It's Christ's supply that we have. It's Christ's activity that appears on earth as your activity or my activity. Do you see that? And so it is, and so it is, and so it is. Thank you.